So I'll ask again. So Tom, when we talked last week, uh, you told your story up until you crossed the Rhine River. Do you want to take your story from there and continue on? That would be fine. Okay, go ahead. When we, when the troop ran up the ran up to the Rhine. It was a picnic for some, but for others it wasn't so much of a picnic. I uh, got some additional duties. One was setting out a smoke screen. Uh, they gave me some equipment that uh, would keep the enemy from finding you. I didn't think much of it, so I discarded my smoke screen equipment pretty quick because it was a cloudy day anyway. Anyway, after that, there was some talk, as I understand, about the V-2s. Oh. The V-2s went right over our position. I say our position. That, that was artillery position. Uh, and a lot of times they were fairly low. You could reach up and scratch their belly almost. And one had a little trouble going over us. And uh, It, uh, well, it's, it's motor or whatever kind of equipment they had on it, conked out, and uh, uh, it crashed, came down and crashed about I'd say a hundred yards from us, maybe a hundred yards. Is that right? Yeah. And of course, everyone thought that was great stuff. We get to talk about a B-2. Now, there were B-1s, but they, they weren't near as sophisticated and as good and uh, they reached their target more than the others. Of course, their target was London, a lot of them in London, uh, but uh, there was a lot of them that wanted to re hit Uh, the seaports along there, the, and Holland. Holland had a lot of sea lanes that led out into the into the ocean when they were loaded and ready to go. So there were several that. Uh, of course, that was a long ways from us, but uh, it was still quite a quite a show. Mm. 
Now, did that one that crashed near you guys, did it, did it explode or was it a dud or? Uh, I guess it was a dud because it started to burn uh, right after it crashed. Mm. And, and then the, the really did burn from then on. Now, uh, Antrop was a, was a Holland port where they were headed, and several of them were guided. Yeah, they they were programmed to to go into that port because the bulge was if everything had went right for Jerry, the bulge was supposed to be open, and it would have been, but uh, we won the bullet battle, so uh, that didn't work out too good for, for Jerry. There was a uh, really some heavy fighting. I remember several times getting pretty wet winding up in a canal, but that was better than being shot at by Jerry. Hmm. But uh, casualties, Allied casualties, especially an airborne outfit was very, very high, and uh, we were supporting, well, we we're supposed to provide some, some help, but we, uh, came up short in a lot of cases. And that makes you feel kind of bad. Uh, anyway, finally got out of those canals and uh, the amount of artillery was uh, the greatest greatest numbers of rounds that had ever been fired in battle. Mm. Greatest number of rounds. And of course the number of pieces that fired those rounds was uh, pretty great too. Uh, it started out with a 76 millimeter. Now that was a very good gun, but only at close combat, or where you could see the see Jerry real good and uh, get a good shot at him. Then it went into the 105, 105s, and that's what I provided information for the, the firing crew to use. I, I've i worked with 105 batteries. 155, a little bit. 155 was a, a, a bigger piece of equipment. And uh, Then we went into the eight inch. Now, I, eight inch, that's a eight inch diameter shell. Wow. Coming at you. And they, uh, they call those the long toms. 
and uh, I'm sure you've seen big trucks on the highway here or in the States and that's the size of a piece of a piece of equipment that towed those long toms. Wow. So you didn't you didn't want to get too close to the front with a tow in a long tom because you'd soon get shot at it and uh, to set a long tom up for shooting, firing, it'd probably take a full day. Well, that, and then another one that was used to some extent was a 44, I believe a 40, a 144. Yeah, 144. Uh, piece of equipment. And it again was used for, if you're firing at a target, seven or eight miles, maybe 10. And it, it, it was made for real destruction. Well, after the long toms were in use, the troops with the smaller caliber pieces of equipment and the infantry they were ready to get across the Rhine and of course they were programmed primarily for uh, walking across a bridge. Now you may wonder where did this bridge come from? Well, when all of this fighting was going on, the combat engineers were they, they had the task of building a bridge across the Rhine River. Now, in the book that, that I gave you, they, they, uh, there's some pictures of combat engineers building bridges. And as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> they should give those guys a medal because like clockwork, when the fighting was stopped or had to be programmed for a different area or something, like across the Rhine, when they pulled him out of action, the the combat engineers were already up there in position building that bridge and there were different bridges uh, and of course in in Holland we to cross those canals it took a variety of bridges other than the 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 ones where the pontoons are already put together and they just flop those out and but they they had a lot of times they had to bolt and screw those uh huge metal bridges so my hat goes off to the combat engineers
When I went across, I have to, I think I mentioned this on the, the meeting before, uh, that I went across in a Higgins boat, and mm -hmm. that was made by Mr. Higgins, and who lived in, in uh, New Orleans. New Orleans, New Orleans. And there, I've been told, uh, now I, I haven't been down there to see it, but I've been told that there's a statue for Mr. Higgins. And I know there's a, uh, well, it's, I think they call it an educational museum directed at uh, World War II. And Eisenhower was behind getting that. Ambrose. Stephen Ambrose. And Steve Ambrose wrote the book and did all that, but yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Steve Ambrose wrote a lot of good, good books. I have two or three of them. Where yeah. we? You heard the story about about me in the river, didn't you? Uh huh. You talked about it the last. Well, we won't go over that again. Okay. Although I thought it was kind of good. <laughs> uh, after that little episode, uh, there was a parachute drop. A lot of people don't know this unless you were there. There was what? A parachute drop. Oh yeah. Uh, they they dropped right on the very side of the river. But the fighting for them, they were far enough back that Jerry was up here fighting, fighting us guys. And uh, it was, uh, the casualties were to that airborne troop and it was, I think, the seventeenth came or came late over overseas. There were seventeenth airborne was late, but there were eighty second airborne people there too. Now I uh, saw 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 them and I chatted with them a little, but after. Uh, everyone got in their position they thought they were supposed to be in. We headed north east. Let's see, north. Yeah, we headed headed out northeast. And uh, Jerry was behind us, so there we were headed that way, but the battle was back here. So, and uh, it got pretty rough as soon as uh, everybody figured out what they were supposed to do. <laughs> hmm. uh, we spent a night and, uh, well, we, we I, I spent a night because of the artillery pieces were moving up and that changed what I was doing. That changed the coordinates that I had to work with and the maps. So we, we had some pretty heavy work, hard work I should say. And uh, we were on the north side of what they call the, the Ruhr Pocket. And Jerry wasn't going to give up yet. He was still 
he was surrounded, actually surrounded in the north pocket. And there was thousands of troops in there, and surrounded. So, uh, finally got finally got the uh, infantry squared away on which way they were going. Finally got the artillery squared away. We were firing on ourselves for a while because Jerry would have been up, he was up there and he was down here and he was over here. So. How was it, how was they, how, how they coordinated that day when they're in little parcels like that? Well, this pot, there were thousands of troops in there. Jerry had thousands of troops in there. Uh, and uh, we just more or less, well, fired away. And uh, the next day, now this wasn't our fault, but it was a sad thing. The next day we were advancing up a hill and a steep hill, and there was a cabin at the top. And we, we, the artillery crew, there was a captain and a corporal with me, or I was with them, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, stopped at this cabin, and they had been these hills were, were rough and steep and um, this one GI, he sat down real hard and his M1, and that's what they had, M1 rifles, went off. He sat down on the ground and went off and the gun went off and shot him right in the chest. Oh boy. And he was one day, I'd say one day from ending the war and he got killed and, and that bothered me. That bothers me today. I think of that frequently hmm. and I, I get kind of tore up. Another incident that happened was down in France, if we can backtrack a little. Sure, please do. France had a lot of good cattle. Charlets was what, mostly what they had. A big, strong yeah. Yeah. animal. Yeah, they beaten. Yeah. And there was almost seven or eight of these cattle in a, in a field. And uh, I, we were, we, the artillery crew, and me, there was three of us at that time, probably the same three that was up in the other incident. But anyway, some rounds got away. I don't think they were ours. And landed in these cattle and it killed two or three of them. What was that that got away? Well, these these cattle were in the field, and there were some round, artillery rounds got away. 
Stray artillery. Strayed. Now that happened not too frequent, but but it happened. Uh, and that bothered me too. Maybe not quite as much as that one individual because it's a human and, and the war was closer to being over by about three months. Uh, Did you know it was almost over? Yeah. When I crossed the Rhine, the 24th of March, and uh, the news that we got that filtered up the Rhine in various ways, mainly by troops. That there, there were troops and equipment south of us. And uh, I had uh, good, uh, well, I, ha I had a good working channels with with people and in a couple of cases close relationship with the maybe you've heard of the Ramigan Bridgehead. The what? Can you explain that? Yeah. What I that will. is? Some people call it the Ramagan. It's R A M E G A N, Bridgehead. That was a, a tech sergeant that crossed the river down from us, uh, was the first man in German soil. It's recorded anyway, that way. And uh, then there was the first lieutenant that was the first off officer that was across the Rhine River. Uh, and they took care of those two troops. They, uh, this tech sergeant and this uh, first lieutenant. So they uh, took them out of action and then they saw this wire that was, well, it was charged to, to blow the bridge. But these two Americans got there and they took care of, they, they cut the wire and took care of it and took, and think of the number of people that crossed that bridge after they did that. Uh, you can you hear that? Okay. So uh, that was they were down the river just a little ways from us, but the the in the river was filtered with. They had boats going down with a load of concrete and boats with a load of not concrete uh, uh, explosives to blow up anything along the along the bank and uh, Now where I was, they sent these balloons up with cables. One day there was uh, uh, two or three balloons tethered on uh, cables, and down the river here comes a 
ME262. Now that's a that's the best aircraft the Germans had, fighter aircraft. Messerschmitt 262. Well, he was trying to mess those cables. You know, the cable holding the cable would would be at different heights, and there'd be several of them. Well, evidently he didn't know that these were tethered on cables, and he he got wound up, and uh, his wingtips got wound up in the cable, and he blew up right over. Just well, not right over us, but. You could run out there if you wanted to and get a piece of scrap metal. Huh. Uh, that was quite a show. Uh, well, back, I'm still... on the... Pocket. I'm still on the rear, rear pocket. That's right. Now, was the rear pocket, that's where they had a lot of their industry, is that correct? Oh, yes. And that's why they were fiercely guarding it, I would imagine. Uh, that's right. And that coal and silver and, uh, yeah, it was heavily, heavily guarded. And that was a huge supply. Now the the bottom end, the south end of the rear pocket, emptied it into the Cologne Cologne Range, <clears throat> and they didn't want anyone. Jerry didn't want anyone uh, taking that area away from them because they. There was a lot of industry there, heavy industry, and it had been maintained during the war. So they they fought hard for that. Now, now Tom, you were up north uh, on the north end. Were you were you up there with? Was the British up there with you as well? They weren't with oh. us. They were a joint. There were. The first troops on our north. Okay. Okay. But they they were fighting their show and we were fighting our show. Okay. Uh, yeah, the Brits were up there and the, they were waiting to cross the Rhine. There were lots of British, uh, especially ground troops, waiting to cross just like we were, and they they had artillery batteries firing away. Uh, the little town we crossed that Wessel? Wessel, I was Wessel. Wessel. Wessel, okay, Wessel, the B S S E L, I guess, was the little town that we crossed out. If anyone wants to look it up, um, now when we left the rear pocket, we were. We were getting pretty close to the Russians. We weren't the first troops to meet the Russians, but we we knew they were out here real close. Uh, when we left the Republic, the, the town we were close to was Bodefeld. B O D E F E L D, and again, that's just just little towns, filtered with Jerry's out there, and uh, we get we would get the word every day. Uh,
from the higher ups. The last up on speaking in military, <laughs> uh, Bradley. Bradley was now he was on the he was w w waiting to cross to see what took place, and now I don't know who else was with with uh, that we we knew. I don't think Eisenhower was there, but the Brits they had a lot of high-powered people there, and. Monty didn't like the Allies. Monty was there somewhere, but he, uh, during the entire war, he wanted to be the the head, the head guy, uh, and he was put out during the entire war. That he was, he was, he was in. Eisenhower's place. He thought he was a better guy than than uh, Ike. Well, anyway, we left Bodefeld and we crossed the area where that GI got killed. Well, he accidentally killed himself. And we we got to meet the Russians. They some of them came down and talked to our people. But uh That's one fellow. <laughs> he, he, he says, I, I gave one of them a bar of soap. He thought it was a candy bar and ate it. <laughs> <laughs> now you can believe that. Tried to eat it. What? I bet he just tried to eat it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably. Uh, Well, we're about to the end of the of the story. Now, once you met up with the Russians, was was that the end of the fighting for you? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, now down the river, I'll mention this. Yeah, please. Down the river, the third armored. Now the. Th the armor was, they were south of that, well, they might have crossed on that Ramagan Bridge that I told you about. Because they had to, you see, they had to drive those across on the tracks, on their tracks, uh, because those combat engineers checked out and they said this bridge won't hold the, the weight and what you're going to put on it. Uh, would be very dangerous. Now that bridge eventually did collapse, didn't it? Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Went down. Yeah. When uh, when we met the Russians, when the, or the Allies met the Russians, our our meeting just kind of disintegrated as we went down the river. The story I was about to tell, was, uh, and this was the commander of the, as either the 3rd or the 2nd Armored, uh, the uh, commander of one of those, the, and he was commander of a lot of tanks and a lot of people. Well, he was a major general. He, they were division commanders. 
he was killed by a fanatic uh, G, uh, uh, a fanatic trained under Hitler's youth program. He was 16 years old. They thought they had this guy surrounded and, and he stabbed him with a knife. This kid snabbed this general with a knife in his back. Oh, wow. And of course that was again, hey, this thing's getting too close. And uh, so that wasn't in my outfit, but that, but that, that was in a outfit that had done a wonderful job all during the war. And so close to the end, too, yeah. for him. Do you uh, talk talk about VE Day? Do you remember that day when you when it was announced that the war was finally over, and what were you feeling after all that you had just been through, and you well, survived this thing? Ever, everyone. Uh, well, I'll say everyone, but it seemed like everyone were were cheerful and happy and and. Uh, tell them what they were going to do when they got home. They said, yeah. Look, we've been over here for eight since D Day, and uh, we're ready to go home. Wait, so what he, did I tell you about? Yes, he was out of a job. Yeah, this one fella. <laughs> He flopped down on the on the hillside, and he said, "Hey, I'm out of a job. This thing's over." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, so that was a, yes, a lot of a lot of that, and of course we didn't know where we were going. Yeah, now so the war still was raging in in the Pacific. Was there well, any talk of you being transferred to the Pacific? Uh, yeah, there was talk. Uh, I never got the official word until they shipped us back to France, but that was, they, the Allies, American Allies, the word spread real quick that, hey, the war is in Japan is still going on, and they're, they're just fighting like fanatics down there. And uh, somebody's going to have to go down and help them. Well, I got word after I was in France that uh, they, they had this big group of people and there was a lot of paperwork going on and Evans name was in the pool that was going to ship directly from from uh, France going to ship directly to the Pacific even even with all as long as you guys had been there and all your your battle uh, battles you've been through you didn't have enough points to go home your uh... well that that yeah some some of them did but I didn't some people had enough points. I was 19 years old. That's right. Everything you had just ta talked about yeah. happened before you, you were only 19. The story that you've just told, and you're only 19. Yeah, but uh, there was there was some. Well, I'll say sergeants in in my outfit and. Now, I don't know how they split the, but I'm sure they had a formula <laughs> for the, the, uh, uh, chose the officers that would go. Oh, I don't know about that. But, uh, 
I knew several that were in the category that that was in, and we were selected to go in Pool A, and uh, you get further directions there. And mine was, I, I'm to ship to the Pacific. Well, I, I didn't like that, but I would have gone. Oh I'd boy, have, yeah. I would have gone. Uh, and I know three or four that were close to me. Well, I mean close if you if you had task to be run or you wanna loan him ten bucks. <laughs> you better loan him ten bucks. Yeah. 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 So we sat around there in France and into the winter months. What I'm telling you about you go to this pool and you go to that that took place in August. Oh, so August of 45, so the, the yeah. war in uh, the Pacific was over with or nearly over then at that point, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was getting along, but we didn't uh, have the official word. Yeah. Yeah. So what did, when they said go to these different pools, I mean, what what was your responsibility? Were you just waiting for your next orders or did they have, did you? No, you were, you were, you go to the different pools, you'll get further directions. You'll get further directions. So that meant that you will soon pack Pacific clothing and they had it there. You'll soon pack that, and you'll soon get a little book, you know, Japanese and American. Huh. And, well, that's, I guess, the best they could do. Uh, and you'll soon be dodging uh, torpedoes and bombs and heavy aircraft and the weapons they use down there. Um, I know a fellow that was wound up in one of those pools and uh, he, <laughs> he, uh, he might still be laughing. <laughs> he was so happy. And weren't they going to send you down there? Or maybe you were there. No, yeah. oh, I uh, When the war ended, I was in Kingsville, Texas. Oh. Kingsville, Texas. Flying planes. Yeah. So it must have been very hard for you after all that you'd been through going across Europe and then the being excited and happy that the war ended in Europe to find out now maybe you have to go and do it all over again. It must have been well, hard to was, accept. It was a uh, let down, but uh, the Americans, well, first the Brits had run out of ground troops. We were close to running out of ground troops. Now that's probably not known by a, a lot of people, but uh, as far as the U.S. was, and the Brits both, they, they felt this on D-Day. That's the reason they had to go to Italy there was a lot of good troops in Italy, but they, uh, Jerry knew that, and he he did his best to tie them up. There was good outfits in Europe, 
in Italy, I mean, the 88th Division, the 45th Division, the 44th, uh, they were all down there, and you couldn't just pull them out and open the gate because Jerry will move in. So they had to, they had to take the chance on shipping them to D-Day and, and pray that D-Day happens. Wow. Yeah, and it, it did. But it was dicey there for a while, huh? Yeah, oh yeah. In fact, Bradley, General Bradley, was, uh, well, he was a, he, he had a very responsible job and he was doing, he was liked by everybody. He, he did a, a good job uh, on shifting troops around. And uh, getting them into the right place at the right time. All through the war, mm -hmm. he he was one of the first generals. I got close enough to touch. Is that right? Yeah. Up in the up in the bulge. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. But he did, he did a. A wonderful job, I think. A true uh, soldier's general, from what I understand. He was. He he was a GI's GI. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's not my story. So then, uh, so uh, to to cap off your story, so you're in in France then when when VJ Day was announced then. Yes. And and so. Finally, it's over for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the BJ Day was announced in August. Uh huh. Correct. I forget the date. Fifteenth. Fifteenth. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, I was there, and, and I I just rested. Uh, I didn't go to. Well, I was uh, very happy. A lot, sure, I hope that. A lot of people. Uh, because. You're going from one battle to another battle. Uh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Then how much longer after VJ Day uh, were you in Europe before you finally were able to take a trip, troop ship home? I caught a troop ship in... Uh, not a... It was January, wasn't it? Yeah. So you had to stay that much longer in Europe then? Yeah. Oh, boy. It was January the 15th, I believe. I thought it was more like right of the New Year's Day. It was close to New Year's. Maybe it was. It, it was in January anyway. Yeah. And that's because you didn't have enough points, or is that why you... Yeah, okay, the point system was fair for a lot of people, unfair for a lot of people, that's yeah. the way it was looked at. But the points were based... If you were married and have a wife and a child or two, you would be at the head of the point system. And of course, if you're overseas, you get points for that. And you get points for uh, awards, decorations. Now I, I and, you, and your record, your good record, Um, overseas, yeah, uh, Purple Heart, well, you got, I got points for the Bronze Star, and the time over there, and a good record. But you were probably disadvantaged because you were single in 19, probably, I would imagine. <laughs> probably didn't help you, huh? No. Yeah. No. But uh, being over there in the time, 
and the award, uh, that helped a bit. Mm -hmm. But our sergeant was, he was in his thir upper 30s. He was in his upper 30s. Mm -hmm. And he's from Kansas, by the way, down the southeast corner. Uh, but he ha he he was married, and wife, and they, his kids were. I mean, they weren't babies. They they were between babies and teenagers, what hmm. he got. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh. He was in there, and, and the, the gun crew, the guy in charge of, of the, the guns was a I think, well, I know he was in his thirties, lower thirties. Another fellow that got got killed, but this was in Sergeant Crawford. He had put in a tour in Iceland. Did you know that we had? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Jerry wanted Iceland because it would have made a good U-boat repair facility and docking facility. Well, this sergeant, he he put in a, a tour of duty up there. They sent him, and I think he was there 12 months, hmm. maybe it was nine. Then they sent him back to the States and from there overseas and he got overseas when the war was, well, was pretty close to being over. But he was uh, crossing the street, and this happened. This happened after the bulge. Uh, he was crossing the street and and. This shell, like that's a 90 degree angle. When the shell hits that point on that 90 degree, part of it's going that way and part of it's this way. And there's not too much, and that shell landed in the, in the, I cornered that building and exploded and killed him right on the spot. Mm. Now I was in a building with a captain, no, a first lieutenant. And we were, we had sense enough that you don't, you don't get close to the windows to look out. You get back here and look, use your glasses to look out. Well, I saw this. And that shell part that came in, our, our, building. There was a bed in there and it just, it just like you sweep the floor. Went down a stairway and out, and out a wall. Wow. And that was a big shell, like a, a, a 170 milli, millimeter, that's bigger than our 105s or 155s. So it just missed you and that lieutenant in the room then, huh? I was in the room. Oh, yeah. Geez. Well, it, it just wiped it clear, and I, I saw that. And of course, then we, the war kept going on. And we, we watched it, and we called in artillery. Well, our man was dead, and he was a good man, 
I mean, I, he, had, he was an experienced soldier, but we took the, the brunt. Uh, those things hang on. Oh, sure, I'll bet. With you. Mm. Well, now we met the Russians and Oh, one thing I should say about uh, when we crossed the crossed the Rhine and got over into Germany after the Ger German uh, Ruhr Pocket, which was a tough fight. Uh, We run into several concentration camps. Oh. Nothing, not the big ones, but maybe one or two thousand it was the biggest. Now, as you went down the river, now those guys, they, they run into larger, camps, larger holdings of American GIs, and they'd have a mixed uh, like the the airborne would be thrown in with the well, just the other Prisoner, I guess they could round up and throw in there, but we saw enough. Oh. We saw enough. Oh boy. Hmm. So then, in, in January 40, uh, 46, then you finally went home. Took a trip, a troop ship home. Yeah. 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 And where did you guys land in the states? Okay, we landed back at the, in a New York harbor, and uh, there were people there to pick us up, but they didn't have any big ceremony for us. What, was that a pretty good feeling, going into the harbor and seeing the Statue of Liberty? And Oh, that was a great feeling. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great feeling. And uh, going in there, and, and they treated us good, I say they. Uh, they had a, well, they had a lieutenant colonel in charge of, and there were other people. I mean, I just, yeah, that, that made you feel good. Yeah. But this, Lieutenant Colonel, he was in charge of making sure that everybody coming in there, and I was gonna got a steak dinner. Oh boy! And of course, that's the first steak we'd had for quite a while. Sure, I'll bet. Didn't make you sick? No, it didn't. Some of those guys, I imagine. Had, had, hadn't had anything, a yeah. good meal, and it, the food was so rich and so wonderful. Yeah. Tom, I wanted to ask you, do you remember when you got word they had dropped the atomic bomb? Uh, there was no, we got word, but it was delayed. There was no big hoop morale until an, I'd say the next day. Uh, that was, I don't, I just think the news wasn't out. How, how would you get your news, Tom? Uh, would yeah. it be uh, the Stars and Stripes or just uh, Star gossip or uh, letters from home? Stars and Stripes. Uh, well, letters from home. You, you could you could get letters from home. Uh, but 
but it was it was very sketchy. Everything was V mail. That's right. Uh huh. Yeah, V mail, and, you, and that's scrutinized real close. Censored. Uh huh. So, I I think that's another case where it's that's as good as we can do. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't pick up BBC radio. Or anything? Oh yeah, yeah. We could do that. So you're now you're back in New York. Uh, how long did you stay there before you shipped off to where you were discharged, or how long? Okay, we we, we were in New York only. We got off of that boat just just in a hurry. And they had people there, uh, all kinds of people. I mentioned this lieutenant colonel. Uh, he was a cook for the day, <laughs> I guess. Uh, they had, uh, you get clean clothing, And then they let out the word that why why they were they wanted us there another another day, and that was uh, we had to assemble out in the courtyard, and uh, we're going to get this. Some people didn't have the rewards yet. I don't know. I, I don't know why. Anyway, they, they worked on that a bit. And we got the steak dinner the next day. Good food, I mean. And, and we were we were there a day until we got everything. They wanted to put me in the reserve for sure. <laughs> they still had some fighting to do. <laughs> no, no, they wanted live there looking down the road for the next war. You know. <laughs> But I imagine you wanted no part of that. No, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't sign up. Uh, but I got. They're going to give me all kinds of credit. It's going to make me the next rank up. So yeah, they were. They were going. But I. Uh, I had a brother in the army at Camp Lee. Camp Lee is is in Virginia. Now I found out how to get to Camp Lee. He was in. He finally wound up in a, uh, Actually, in barracks, across the road from me. Is that right? <laughs> right. Huh. Yeah, he was. He was assigned just for a couple of days across the road. So the next morning, we got in touch with each other, and uh, he had a car. <laughs> he he. Didn't fight a very rough war. <laughs> uh, so we got in his car and went to. His, he had a house. He lived. I, no, I don't. I think he just rented it. Yeah. But then he, after we got all this food, good stuff, and and finally convinced him that I just couldn't see. Joining the reserve, 
that uh, I, I had business down in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so we went to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, spent a day touring, maybe two days, but that was, then I caught a train, a troop, uh, another troop train, and rode that to St. Louis, Missouri. Ah. Is that where you, you were discharged in St. Louis then? No. Oh. Uh, well, no, actually, I got out of the when I got off that train in St. Louis, I was a civilian. I, I got discharged. Back, back east? Yeah, oh, back okay. east. Because uh, it had to be part of what had to be done after we give you this stake and we try to put you in a reserve and we're going to promote you and we're going to do all this. Uh, that was, had to be taken there. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, back in Missouri, and this was a tough part, which I'll never forget. Uh, I got out of the got out of the army and I didn't have a ticket <laughs> or anything. But when I left France, you could take $300 home. And that was written out in a book. You, you couldn't, you couldn't fudge on it and get more money. I got, I still have that little pay book. Is that right? Yeah. Uh. I, in fact, I look at it every now and then. <laughs> uh. Uh, but I hitchhiked from St. Louis to Plata, Missouri. And all that way I thought, God, I won the war. And here they got me hitchhiking home. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh. And when I got to La Plata, it was well, that's a real town. It was uh, dark. It was nighttime. Did your folks know you were coming home? No. Oh wow. <laughs> no, because uh, that got. I had the ticket, my $300 covered everything. Uh, but getting on that, that car, coming home, but I'll never forget this part of it. There was a couple, a married, I guess they were married, a young couple. I had to be married. They were, they were on that bus that I finally got, got on after hitchhiking a ways. They offered me their seat. Wow. Huh. You know thought, what? They offered me their seat. Oh. They were on there and they had a seat. And the bus was pretty well loaded. I mean, there wasn't any vacant seats. And I thought, God, this guy is going to give me his seat. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I took it. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they just insisted that I take that seat. Mm. And I did. And that's the, uh, the, uh, well, that's not quite all of it. That got me to La Plata. That got me to La Plata, and the guy's name there was Naughton, and he had a taxi cab. And do you know that uh, 
I called him up because I, my folks gave me his number when I, I, I knew this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I called that guy and here I, I thought he would surely get out of bed and come over there and get me and haul me home. I was willing to pay him ten bucks, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't do it. I lived out in the country. Hmm. That guy wouldn't do it. Uh, I didn't win the war, but I helped. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where it ended. So how did you get home then? Did you just hitchhike or...? No, he, uh, uh, he finally hauled me home, but he charged me five bucks. That's a bad part. <laughs> <laughs> no, I finally talked him into it. I said, look, I'm, I just, I'm dead tired. I just came back from Europe and I need a ride. Will you give me that? And he finally said, yeah. And that's how I got home. Oh, boy. boy. What time of the day was that? That was, it was still dark, like, well, three o'clock when the episode started. Trying to get a ride, and finally getting one. And, but he, I never did like the guy. You see, he was a c civilian when I was a, a GI overseas. Hmm. So it must have been nice to finally be home after all that. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was. It must have been a great homecoming. Your mom must have been just... She was the happiest person yeah. in the family. Well, she had three, three sons in the service. Wow. Did she ever talk about that? What afterwards? What 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 she was going through? What she was feeling? You know, with you guys, you particularly overseas and in, in in the thick of the battle. I mean, it must well, have been terrible for her. She she would talk about it, but she wouldn't push it. But she would she would talk about it and. And she said, I, I tried to always guess what part of the Europe you were in. Because you couldn't tell her. You were censored. Right. So she... Uh, she guessed about where one of the armor... She thought I was in the... Uh, uh, armored for quite a while and I couldn't write back and say hey you're right no <laughs> 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 uh, well getting a letter from home was a big thing wasn't it yeah it was did we get any packages I got I got some clothing, uh, and that supported the boats. And uh, and uh, got cookies, cookies once, <laughs> and I got a, a an aunt sent me a Bible. The New Testament was, and uh, <laughs> I, I partially had a girlfriend. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna tell this story. What? About my girlfriend over in Ireland. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so she wasn't a girl from home. She was someone you met over in Europe? Well, I had one when I went over. When 
overseas. Mm -hmm. But uh, the mail system broke down <laughs> on that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so that one fell through. And that happened. And I had this. I wonder what did Jerry, you see, in the bulge, we were overrun. And I lost all of my equipment. I had this little musette bag, and I always had uh, some crackers, something that would keep you alive. If you had a, and if you're going to be up there for two or three days, you'd put a can of that cheese, which is like chewing on rubber. So I always tried to carry a little of that. That'll keep me alive if Jerry finds me. Well, I had this big picture of this girl. And that's a good looking picture. So I had that in my music bag. And we were overrun, and I lost all of that stuff huh. in the boats. And I, even though that girl was in there, I couldn't go back and get that back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that's, that's where one went. <laughs> uh. Then that one overseas was, uh, I met in Ireland. Now this took place after the war. Oh. Yeah, it was Ireland. But it was just a... Just a, an acquaintance. Now, were you... Did you go over to Ireland on a furlough, or how did you get to Ireland? Or what were you doing in Ireland? Well, Ireland was a free state in the, during the war, uh -huh. so they... They were bombed once, but that's a, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was a more or less a pleasant trip. Yeah. The Irish people, uh, they, this is a free state, not, not the upper part. They treated you like you won the war down, down in Erie. So yes, they, they were very nice. Mm. Uh, and the whole, the Irish people, they'd want to take you out to dinner. And <laughs> now this is after the war. In fact, this was as soon as, as uh, Japan was over. Okay. So we, that was happy. I just went in. You see, the, to to run these places back in France, they had a turnover of turnover personnel real fast because a lot of the guys they might have an office officer that's doing something, maybe a couple of GI that's doing something, but not very much, uh, and. Uh, trips, if you kept your nose clean and uh, did a good job while you were there and didn't bellyache and bitch and carry on, why uh, a lot of those people were, they didn't have any points or enough points. So they would uh, let you, uh, or they would uh, I can't think of the word. They let you come in and talk about uh, furloughs if you if okay. you Okay. About what? Furloughs. Furloughs. And that's how you got to Ireland on that's a furlough? That's how I got to Ireland. Okay. But once you left the camp, you were on your way to catch transportation of any, like the Red Ball Express. Have you ever heard of it? Red Ball Express is a truck system that's 
Well, this guy drove, drove those trucks 90 miles an hour regardless of what was down the road. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so you see a Red Bull Express coming. He's, he's not stopping for anybody. But you could wave them down and they'd, they'd give you a ride because most of them were black guys. Okay, right, yeah. And they, they didn't get in on much of the fight. The blacks were segregated from... Uh, yeah, yeah, they were until Truman, Truman right. got into the play of things and got, got home. Anyway, you could get a ride. With a, now the French, they wouldn't stop and give you a ride. They wouldn't? They Even wouldn't. after you've liberated, liberated that them? That didn't mean anything. They had a sharp memory. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not too much, anyway. Uh, so, well, getting back to being at home, it must have been wonderful to be in your home and sleep in your own bed and oh, yeah. have mom's home cooking and... <laughs> yeah. It was. Oh, that was great. Uh, I I helped right out when I got home uh, because I could see my dad needed help on the farm. So there was no rest for you. You went almost right away back to work then, huh? Well, yeah. I was never a person to sit around. Yeah. I, I tried to do work, help out. And the food, yeah, the food was always better and good. And. Uh, There was always plenty of it. So let's talk a little bit now past uh, your post-war years. Uh, you, did you stay on the farm or eventually go on to a different... Uh, I helped my dad just doing what I was explaining uh -huh. for six months. From the time I got home I up Till, uh, well, till the August, ended in August. Help with harvest? Yeah, help with a lot of the harvest. Uh, Were there any jobs available back then, Tom? No. People looking? The people, there were some, some jobs, but very scarce. Uh, and of course, World War II brought the country out of the Depression. Uh, my brother, well, he, he was a college graduate and he got a, he got a job pretty, pretty quick, one of them. And uh, the other one entered, uh, <laughs> why he did, well, he wanted, he entered a, a clerical school. And he wasn't clerical, strange, or I didn't think he was. But he picked up that, all those machines they had and just run them like he'd been doing it for, <laughs> for years and he got a job in Kansas City doing that. In fact, he went through their entire school and uh, got out and got a job just right out there where he got trained. Now the other one, I don't know, well he was married, I don't know. Well, I do. He, he got a job in the St. Louis area. There's a field, 
a field, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, Scott Field, Scott Field, maybe you've heard of it. Now when you see these big planes go over that you, that you can almost scratch their belly, only they're planes. He, when he, he had a college degree and he went out to that Scott Field and they hired him right off because he had radio training and, and, and in the, in the, he's in the Navy. In the Navy, he uh, had some pretty high training. I mean, he worked on radios and a lot of pretty sophisticated stuff. And so yeah, they got they got it on there. Two of them. How about you? What did you? Uh... I worked six months on the farm. Helped my dad, mom, and me. I I now I hitchhiked from Macon, Missouri, to. Greeley, Colorado. Huh. And I got to, got to, I'd do anything, almost anything. I got a job with a trucker. He was, he was hauling, you know, 55 gallon drums of oil, but they, instead of in tanks slushing around and <laughs> burning, they were in 55 gallon drums. And he had a, a truck load of those things. And just a little ways out of Kansas City, heading this way, uh, he stopped and gave me a ride. Well, I. I thought he was going to chicken out, but he, he stopped and he said, I don't give his hackers a ride. <laughs> I thought, well, why'd you stop? <laughs> 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 and, uh, and he said, I don't give his hackers a ride, I told you that. And I, I said, yeah, I know, but look, it's getting dark. It was, it was six o'clock. It was later than that, probably eight. And he said, Get in! <laughs> and, I, and boy, I smiled and, and I got in. And he said, Now, and he had a water jug and a coffee cup, I guess, <laughs> and uh, some something to chew on there, some cheese bits or something like that. He says, if you knock any of that over, I'll stop this truck and kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought, I won't kick it, I won't kick it over, I'll, I'll be good. I'll be good, I emphasize it. And I was, and that guy went all the way to St. Francis, Kansas. Now, you've probably heard of that place. Northwestern part of the state. Yeah. He gave me a ride all the way. It's right on the line, the Colorado <laughs> line. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, this is as far as I go. And, but he gave me a ride all that distance, although he was going to kick me out. He never <laughs> did. <laughs> is he the one that told you? Don't go to sleep or lay on his shoulder or something? Yeah, he said, you go to sleep. He said, oh, he's going to kick me out on a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about your sister? Did she do anything for the war? Was she married? Or? No, she wasn't married. And two years ago, Well, she married a, married a dentist, and when it two years ago she died? Ten, ten. What? It was ten years ago. 
was when you were in Denver. Ten years ago, I was TDY to Denver. No, in 1999 is when she passed 1999. Away. You're in the hospital down there. Oh, I was in the hospital in Denver, <laughs> and, and she died. She passed away, yes, yeah. they wouldn't let you go. They wouldn't let me go to the funeral. Oh, boy. Uh, but she wasn't, she was in her 50s. She wasn't old at all. But they tried everything. She had pulmonary problems. So she died for the lack of, I guess, oxygen. Or the right. Her heart was overworked. Uh, and that was, and she was the youngest of the whole crew. Yeah. yeah. So why were you heading to Greeley? Go to school. Oh, okay. Well, I was going, I went a little early because I had to buy, I had to find a place to, to, to live. And I had to, I had to rent that. And uh, the first year I, I lived in a, a couple's house in their basement. And there were two other guys in there. And so it was really too crowded, but that's all we could find. And the other, the next year, I um, there was an area south of the South Hall. South Hall, they call it, and it's behind the agriculture building. And you had to be an XGI to live there. So, as soon as I found out what, how do you get in this place, why well, I, I started to work. Uh, so I was an XGI and I, I got in, got my name on the list, and I got in there and I lived two years. Now, where'd they get these barracks? Parsons, Kansas. Yeah, they were old GI they were barracks old. moved in. They called them South Hall. Huh. They were, huh. they were uh, girls' quarters in Parsons, Kansas, because that's where they were training girls to be waxed. Oh, huh. <laughs> and they moved it. Moved them out to Greeley, and they moved them out to Greeley now. They out. moved them to Fort Collins. Oh, you they moved them to oh CSU. Oh, okay. yeah, CSU. So that was well. That was a good move. I they were good and clean and and were you able to take you took advantage of the GI Bill for your schooling? Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Well, and what did you end up getting your major in? Agronomy. In what? Agronomy. Yeah. Well, that's I stuck with the farm. I, I, before I went in the service, I worked on the farm. Yeah. When I got out of the service, I still worked on the farm, and I. I liked a clean life, and I liked uh, the independence that you had. So uh, and I, I never did go hungry. I always had a source of food. Yeah. 
So once you graduated, is that what you went on to a, a career in agriculture then, or what did you do for a career? No, I bought this farm, and I had a guy run it for two or three years, all more than that, half a dozen years. He ran it. His name was Sipes, and he lived. I get. He lived right down the road here on 68. Anyway, uh, I had him run it because I was, well, I had another job, not necessarily in agriculture, it was with Mountain Bell Telephone. Oh. You've heard of mm -hmm. it. Mountain Bell Telephone. And their building still stands down by the next to the railroad tracks and across the street from the bank there. It's not Frost Bank. Well, it's big across the almost across the street from Safeway store. Okay. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So you came out here to go to school and just and stayed in the area then? Well, we had in a mine where my wife and I getting stiff. We, we have this background we have this land and we had it paid for and we're going to be farmers <laughs> so well talk how you met how you and jody met oh well uh, this has a funny story too i was uh, i was living in south hall that's the place I tried uh -huh. to describe. Where you live in where? South Hall. That was the old, old, uh, barracks. Barracks. So I was, and I could just, I'd pass it, going to lunch or from lunch or sometime close. Now, and you lived there. And we all ate in the cafeteria. And we all ate in the in the cafeteria. <laughs> and that's where I worked. And that's where she worked. <laughs> she dished out the food along this line, and when she would see me coming, she would make that dish excessively big. <laughs> I, I, you know, and cake and all that stuff, and she put that down on the shelf underneath. And then when the, the mean in dietetic instructor came by <laughs> looking for that food, he couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> she, got, she wanted to know what I was doing under the, I was at the, you know. I had it. <laughs> it was, uh, she wondered, she, why did you put, you know, what's this doing under uh -huh. here? And I'd have all the big pieces of pie and uh -huh. cake under there. <laughs> So that's, that's how I... Somebody I knew went by, I could put it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, well... She very seldom, it was late at night when she came in. I guess this was a surprise visit. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get fired over that? No. <laughs> no. She just asked me what I... I grabbed it and put it up real quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's how I met her. How many years have you guys been married now? Oh, golly. 61. Is that right? 61. What's that? 61. 61. So what, what, what year does that make you married in? 1950. Fifty. Yeah. yeah. He was still going to school at CSU when I went to CSU. 
bless you. And uh, he, I was working in the cafeteria. That's where I got my food. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I ate there, and I made enough to pay my, you know, to eat. Yeah, right, sure. And had a little left over. <laughs> and uh, I worked in a. It's called Ammons Hall. Uh -huh. And we had to walk up at night and we counted the dishes in and out and we just there were two three of us lived there and we took care of Ammons Hall in between you know yeah. stuff like that okay. extra things uh -huh. and go down and make sure the showers were all turned off and you know after the swimming was over right and so I got my room and or my room there, and I got my board at the cafeteria uh, over at the cafeteria. Uh, what do they call that building where the cafeteria was? Well, uh, the administrative building. No, it was next to the administrative building. It was, it was administrative buildings here. It was right here. What do they call that? Was that next to the railroad track? Yes. Well, the physics building was along there. Was it in the oval? No, oh, it was. It, it, well, it faced the the. You could get into it from the oval. Okay. Yeah. It was the the. Uh, it was right here. Yeah. Uh, That's okay. It's yeah. And how many children and grandchildren, great grandchildren, do you guys have? Oh no, you got to count these. Uh oh, <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> no. We had three kids, two boys, and the third one was a girl. Michael and Pat and Kayleen, and the boys both married. And they had two kids apiece. So I, we had four grandkids. And the grandkids <laughs> all got married. And we have, we had one, two, three, four, five great granddaughters. What? They're all girls. Is that right? Yeah. My goodness. We only have one grandson. And five granddaughters, and then the one grandson married a woman that has two kids. So we actually have seven great grandkids. <laughs> huh. Huh. Well, through the years, Tom, have you ever kept in touch with anybody you served with or gone to any sort of reunions or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Well, we went over to Europe. Oh, boy. And we were there. We went through all these areas we talked about. Mm -hmm. The bows, uh, northern France, rural pocket. Got he could. And, uh, we went to Omaha Beach, Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, and uh, how was that trip for you? Did it bring up a lot, stir up a lot of memories? And well, not really bad. Yeah. Uh, I covered some bad incidents. There, there's one that's not that I'm disappointed in the in the U.S. lookout for equipment. I took this. Now I'm sure you've heard of the SS troops, and they're real. I mean, they're they're out to kill. Oh, That's absolutely, yeah. SS troops, and they were on the north 
show order, but I was on a north show order, so I know, and uh, we had a lot of troops on the north shore order. That's the north shoulder of the boats. Well, I personally took this equipment off of an SS officer who was a, I don't know whether he was the driver of this, it wasn't a tiger tank, it was, it was a Mark Six, Mark Six. That's just, there's a Mark Five and there's a Mark Six, and then the Tiger is the biggest. Will scare you even if you just see him a mile away. Hmm. Well, I mentioned this uh, North Shore because that's where this guy, this guy was known all over, all over the war. I mean. Uh, the number of American tanks he'd knocked out and the American soldiers he had killed and, and, and uh, the American Mark four, five, and six tanks he'd marked. Now I don't know how many of them is true, but I know some of them are because I saw the holes in them. And it, they all had an 88 millimeter gun on them. Oh boy. And now that gun could be used direct, indirect, or anti-aircraft fire. I was always shooting at these guys. Anti-aircraft. Well, anyway, this, this, uh... Were you in Germany or in, still in Belgium? No, we were still in Belgium. We were... We were at where they had the Belden Massacre. In fact, he was, his troops were, they're the ones that did the dirty work. Hmm. You're talking about Piper. Piper, Piper is his name, yeah. P-I-P-E-R? Yeah. He was in charge of, Hitler picked, personally picked him. And uh, he uh, picked his assignment. His assignment was to eliminate where we were. Well, it didn't work quite like that, but it came close to it. Uh, Would he, well, what, what well, happened to him? They execute him? Yeah. Piper, no. Piper got Piper off. Piper got set free. Got stuck, got free. Uh, what I was trying to lead up to, he, he told Piper to get the Americans out of the American clothing. These people in the get them, put our people in the American clothing. So, and that was a big scale. That involved about, well, over three thousand people on the front. On the front. And the other thing was get de screw up the the call signs. You had a call sign like Red Rose or Darling. And then get their equipment. Get the Americans' equipment and paint it with the star and make it look right. Make it look like this is been done by, by us. And I was, I was on the, the front 
I was on the front position, about as close as you could get to, to the war, because I was in that area, and I personally took off a Luger pistol. Uh, that's a, their best pistol. Another one is the P-38. And I took off his Iron Cross. You've seen these pictures mm -hmm. of the Iron Cross. Yeah. Now that's a high metal in, in, over there. And he was clean. He was, he, he didn't sleep in the mud the night before. He was clean. And what else did he? Was he a forward observer that you're talking about? No, he can't. Well, I don't think so. He got out of a tank. Oh. That's where he made his mistake. They surrender? Well, yeah, after we forced him to. <laughs> but I got this equipment. What I'm reading that, I got this equipment. I personally took it off of this guy. Were you able to keep that? Is that, or would you have okay. to? Okay, I was willing to keep that and I carried it all the way to the, the fields in, in France, coming home. I had all that stuff uh -huh. hid away. And I took it to the supply room and I talked to a, to a, well, the man in charge of supplies who gave you clean clothing and all that, and he took care of your, your rifle. You stored your rifle there. You're going on a, on a leave. And I kind of came home and I went in, came back and I went to get my equipment and it's nowhere. They oh, stole geez. it. Now, that, that really got to me. I mean, I, I if I'd have found it, I took this off of this guy. Yeah. Wow. And uh, Piper got off. He went through the the trials down at. Nuremberg, but he essentially, I heard he wound up selling cars in Paris. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's some little town in France, but nobody wanted, you know, they didn't want anything to do with him, so he led a pretty unhappy life yeah. the rest of the huh. because nobody wanted anything to do sure. with him. Sure. Yeah. Huh. He got off. Yeah. Well, Tom, I'll, I, I'd like to ask one more question, and then we'll wind down this interview, and we'll finish it. How do you think your your war experience changed your life, or affected your life, uh, or played a role in your life, or did it, or was it just simply a chapter of your life you went through? How do you think you would answer that question? Oh, I it it had a lot to do with uh, me growing up, mm. me. Uh, I mean, I think I came out of the, the war with experiences and know-how that far exceeds a lot of people. That's, that's older than a lot of people. I, I think a lot of universities are falling short today. They're, uh, un unless you get into a school that really teaches what you're after and what you're trying to get, you better be careful or they're going to make a, a social butterfly out of you, you know? Yeah. And turn you loose, I think. Well, that's... Um
Well, no, that an awful lot took place in a few years, didn't it? Yeah. 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 Most people's lifetimes, you did in a couple years. Yeah. And here you are, you've grown up and you've been through all this and you're only 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. And you know, I look at a kid that's 20 years old and I say, gee, I wonder if he's driving, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, Tom, I, I really uh, want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you.